Representative Sharina Boston. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Good evening, Madam Speaker, again. Good evening, sir. Going now to the bill, the underlying bill, with the two amendments that have been withdrawn. Through you, Madam Speaker, a series of questions, because this, as our good chairman said, is a very important step that we are taking here in Connecticut. A step that had been proposed to us last year, and then we did due diligence, as the good chair said, have the approval of the Connecticut Academy of Pediatrics, and we want to move forward on this piece of legislation. But as we want to do this, we want to make sure that we have the appropriate oversight, the proper controls that need to be in place. Through you, Madam Speaker, questions to the good chair. Representative Ritter. Through you, Madam Speaker, in this legislation, are we only addressing children below the age of 18 or medical conditions have they been added to adults as well through you madam speaker representative ritter okay thank you madam speaker i would point to lines 13 through 24 and on its face it does seem like we are adding conditions for adults and for minors under the age 18 and we are, but what, what we're really trying to do is be consistent because we're, 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 we're originally the, the bill's intent in this section we're talking about is to add conditions for minors under the age of 18, which is line 17 down. But what if they turn 18? You need to have the corresponding conditions for the adult program. So yes, there's additions, but it's really meant to mirror and parallel the minor conditions, which is why it's in the statute and not done through the normal process we have currently, Madam Speaker, through you. Representative Renna Boston. Through you, Madam Speaker, so that I'm clear, so these conditions that are listed in line 17 going on till about 21, they apply to children below the age of 18 and then would automatically be applicable when, if the child were to be, or when the child becomes 18 and older. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Ritter. Madam Speaker, through you, that is correct. Representative Sharon So through you, Madam Speaker, what has already been passed and is now a public act for adult mar medical marijuana, would those conditions in any way be changed because of these conditions that we have now listed in these lines that the good chair was referring to? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Ritter. Through you, Madam Speaker, those conditions that you see listed in lines 8 through 12 are unchanged by this bill through you, and those are the currently existing conditions through you. Representative Sharina Boston. Through you, Madam Speaker, I see in lines 25 through 28 that we are addressing institutional animal care, animal use, and committees. So will this be as far as the research is concerned? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Ritter. That is correct. Through you, Madam Speaker, relates to research. Representative Sharina Boston. Through you, Madam Speaker, could the, could the good chair maybe expand as to where these animals would be used in terms of research? And would, when these animals are used for research, would we be following federal guidelines and policies? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Ritter. Yes, we will be following all federal guidelines, and that was protection that was put in place in agreement with people who do conduct research and who care, obviously, about animal research. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Sharina Boston. And through you, Madam Speaker, the other part of the question is to where would this research be conducted in our state? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Ritter. Yes. Through you, Madam Speaker, it could be at colleges or universities, uh, so that's how we envision the research program ongoing. It could be private or public. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Sharina Boston. Through you, Madam Speaker. I'm very concerned and want to make sure we address issues about the consent that has to be given to the child. Through you, Madam Speaker, could the good chair tell us from whom do we need to get the consent so that medical marijuana could be prescribed? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Ritter. Through you, Madam Speaker, in order to obtain, obtain a registration certificate for medicinal marijuana as a minor, there are three steps. 
the parent or guardian has to sign off, and then two doctors. One is your primary care, the other one who specializes in the, in the treatment of the underlying conditions enumerated herein. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Srinivasan. Through you, Madam Speaker, let us briefly expand on the parent part first, and then I'll come to the physicians after that. Through you, Madam Speaker, in case of a custody situation where both parents are in custody of the child, but obviously they're not together anymore. Through you, Madam Speaker, would we need the consent of one parent or would both the parents' consent be required? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Ritter. That's a, a very good question to you, Madam Speaker. I mean, we define primary caregiver in line 61 and it's basically a person who is 18 years and older who has agreed to undertake responsibility for managing the well-being of the patient. In the case of two parents who disagreed who were divorced, ultimately, you may have to settle that in court potentially to see who was going to take over the, the idea of you know, sort of taking care of the, the medical care uh, or if one person was granted full custody or something like that. But I suppose that could be one that would have to go to the courts if you got to that narrow circumstance through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Renovasan. Three, Madam Speaker, in situations of custody, as if, if the custody is given to one parent, clearly, obviously, there's no issue here. But the concern, as the good chair said, and that is troubling to me, is when both parents have custody of the child, A, and B, one parent does not give consent, because do we need the consent of both the parents? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Ritter. Through you, Madam Speaker, I would say that if both parents had responsibilities for the treatment and well-being of the minor child, um, then I think you would need sign-off from both in that particular instance. Whereas if you had one who was sort of handling those responsibilities, that individual would sort of count as the primary caregiver under this act through you. Representative Serena Boston. Through you, Madam Speaker, the reason I bring up this issue is, you know, wearing my other hat in the other life that I live. For simple medications, it could be as simple as an antibiotic, it could be as simple as an oral steroid that has to be prescribed for a five-day course or a 10-day course to a child with, say, asthma or sinusitis. Quite a few times, it is very intense the battle that occurs between the two parents who have custody of the child, with one parent saying, giving me the approval to prescribe, and the other person saying, they do not want me to prescribe a an antibiotic or a prednisone. And so therefore, I think for us to be clear as to moving forward, when there is, when one parent does not give consent, what will we be doing is something, if not that if we, we are not able to resolve that today, maybe something we need to look into as to how we're going to give consent to the child who obviously needs it, but un unfortunately does not get consent from both the parents. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Ritter. Through Madam Speaker, no disagreement, but I would, I would say to the Chamber, this could apply to any prescription or any therapy or any treatment, as, as the good ranking member mentioned when he prescribed. So, you could change medicinal marijuana for any other prescription, and you could still have this dispute, I suppose, between two parents. And ultimately, that would be a nightmare probably for a family court judge to have to go through. And I imagine it probably does happen rarely, but it does happen from time to time. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Shrena Boston. Through you, Madam Speaker, the guardian or the person who's responsible has to take responsibility for making sure that the medicine is properly you know, you know, kept in the house, not only the marijuana, but also the paraphernalia as well. Through you, Madam Speaker, if this so-called guardian does not take their responsibility seriously and is careless about the products or about the paraphernalia, what then happens through you, Madam Speaker? Representative Ritter. Through Madam Speaker, I, I guess the question, just trying to get this correct, would be that the primary caregiver, most likely a parent in this case, goes to the dispensary, picks up the prescription, and goes home. Um, 
if they somehow uh, misused or something like that, I suppose there's other statutes that could govern that. But, but generally speaking, I would just say this. This is your child you know, going through a pretty horrific thing in a horrific condition, and I would like to think the evils of the world don't penetrate even that kind of fact pattern through you. Representative Trent of Austin. Through you, Madam Speaker, in this legislation, is there any scope or is, has, has it been addressed in terms of liability, in terms of fines, if the guardian does not do what is expected of them? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Ritter. Through you, Madam Speaker, to the best of my knowledge, no. Representative Srinivasan. Through you, Madam Speaker, one of the important components of this bill, which I applaud, is the research component. Because as we know, we do not have a lot of research on the subject matter in terms of its advantages, in terms of its long-term side effects. And so for us to do research in this country where we have not had much research, as you know, Madam Speaker, most of the research has come from Israel and some of them has come from Italy. So for us to do research, we could be the cutting edge as far as research is concerned in medical marijuana. But through you, Madam Speaker, this research in this legislation is it restricted to college campuses and universities, or could anybody who is interested in doing research, could they apply and have the capability and the capacity to conduct research? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Ritter. Through you, Madam Speaker, it could go beyond colleges and universities to other laboratories that want to conduct research through you. Representative Richard Nav I'm sorry, Sharon Vassan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Through you, Madam Speaker, the, it is my understanding that when the certificate is issued to the parent, to the guardian, they go to one dispensary and they can only get the medicine, the marijuana, the medical marijuana from that one dispensary. Is that correct through you, Madam Speaker? Representative Ritter. Through Madam Speaker, that is correct, although there is a, a new language in here that allowed them to change the dispensary if they so chose. Maybe they moved, maybe they didn't like it for a particular reason, but the, the thought is you go to one, but you can change it if you want to, through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Renovasen. So through you, Madam Speaker, if I heard the good chairman well, then if, they have, if they're getting it from one location, but for whatever be the reason, as the good chair said, in terms of relocation, so on and so forth, they would be able to apply and get the medical marijuana from another dispensary, from another site. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Ritter. That is correct. Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Renovasen. Through you, Madam Speaker, as we have heard clearly from the chairman, that the letter requesting the need for medical marijuana needs to come from two physicians, A, a primary care, and the second physician being somebody who's both certified in that area. Through you, Madam Speaker, can that be only done by an MD, a physician, or could an APRN or PA, could they also be providing as a primary care, the capacity to write the request for the medical marijuana. Representative Ritter. Through you, Madam Speaker, they must be physicians. Representative Serena Vassen. Through you, Madam Speaker, and I'm sure we are all very familiar with this, that physicians all don't agree. They always have difference of opinion. And through you, Madam Speaker, if there is a physician that gives one opinion, and the other physician gives just the opposite opinion. Obviously, we all go many times for a second opinion. And if these two opinions don't, are not in sync with each other, through you, Madam Speaker, what then is the option for this particular family? Through you, Madam Speaker. Representative Ritter. Through you, Madam Speaker, if I understand the hypothetical, the primary care doctor says, you know, I think we should try it. I'm willing to write the certificate. The specialist says no. The options are to give up and you will fail to have two doctors that are willing to provide the necessary signatures that you need, or you would go to another specialist, which is very common in the medicine world, to go see another doctor to get a different opinion through you. Representative Sharina Vassen. Through you, Madam Speaker. 
I want to thank the good chair for expanding on my question because that was where I was getting to. So the primary care says, I think you are a candidate to get medical marijuana and suggests to go and see a specialist because we require that. And that's the first specialist says, you do not need medical, medical marijuana. The family then goes to see a second specialist in the same field, a second opinion. And the second opinion says yes. So we have one yes, one no, and one yes. Through you, Madam Speaker, does that qualify the family to go ahead and try to get the medical marijuana? Representative Ritter. It does, through you, Madam Speaker, because the law is recognizing the two yeses, because that's what goes on the letter. So there is no way of knowing if you're presented this, this letter from two physicians who else you may have seen previously and who said no, through you. Representative Srinivasan. Good evening, Mr. Speaker. Good to see you there. Likewise, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So now, in this process, we have, we have a physician that has said yes, a, phys a consultant that has said no, but the second consultant has said yes. And as the good chairman says, we can now proceed further because we have two yeses, and the no does not necessarily count. So then through you, Mr. Speaker, once they go in and get this application through, what then happens if the good chair could walk us through the procedure that the family will go through before they get the medical marijuana? Through you, Madam Speaker. Mr. Speaker, for you, Mr. Speaker. Yep. Thank you, sir. Representative Ritter. Yeah, and I may have done the same thing, so I'm glad you made the mistake yeah. first, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, through you. So you get the letter. Uh, you present it, you would then eventually you'd be able to buy the pallet of marijuana from the dispensary. Um, obviously the letters um, have to uh, identify to both the dispensary and consumer protection that you're now eligible, but once you have that, you would pick your dispensary, go there and pick up the pallet of marijuana through you. Representative Srinivasan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If, the, if and when a physician writes a prescription for an antibiotic, the name of the antibiotic is written, the dose is written, and the duration is written. That is what the pharmacist fills when the patient goes to the pharmacy. But as I understand this, and I want to make sure we are all on the same page here, that is not what happens here. What happens when a physician writes this certificate or the or request for the medical marijuana, there's a lot of uncertainties as to the prescription amount, as a prescription format, and which of the medical marijuanas will be prescribed and, by, and dispensed, I'm sorry, not prescribed, and dispensed, and by whom? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Ritter. Thank you, through you, Mr. Speaker. And, and I had a, a crash course myself the last few days on this. So you have to start with the producers, the actual growers of the medical marijuana. They're the ones who will send to a lab, an independent lab, to test the medicinal marijuana. They will then stick a label on it, like anything else you'd find in a pharmacy that says, these are the ingredients, um, this is, you know, the certain contents that you will find it for this medicinal marijuana. Then it goes to the pharmacist. Now from the, I won't use the word prescribe, but from the ability to then give it to the patient, the way the regs work now is two and a half ounces per month is the max. So doctors really have two options. The doctors can call the pharmacist and say, we recommend an ounce and a half per month. And that would be binding on the pharmacist. What I'm told often in practice is, is they sort of just don't give an order about the, about the ounces, and the pharmacist tends to go to the default of two and a half ounces per. Now, medicinal marijuana for children is very different. And so that may play out a little differently, but the general idea is you have the month maximum and then the doctor and the pharmacist will sort of figure out from there, but there is a maximum you can have per month through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Srinivasan. Through you, Mr. Speaker, so what we have is a maximum similar to what we have in an adult. That is the same amount that is used for an adult as well, the two and a half ounces per month. And then it is the provider, the physician, in, con in conversation with the pharmacist and obviously with the family that decides on what may be a starting dose and then adjust and titrate the dose accordingly depending on the clinical outcome. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Ritter. That's right, through you. And again, they're trying to get it right. 
And so one of the goals is, like any other prescription, we've all been prescribed something, and the doctor goes, I have to up it, or I have to change you know, the, the composition. Or So that is not unusual in any, any field of medicine to do that, and that's what they would do here through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Srinivasan. Through you, Mr. Speaker, along with the dose and the duration, what is unusual about this product as well is it comes in various forms in terms of its chemicals. We know in one form of the medical marijuana, it can have a high THC content. In another proportion, it may have a low content. And according to, for some medical conditions, you choose this. And for some other medical conditions for which medical marijuana is indicated according to this piece of legislation, you may want to choose something else. So it is, it's extremely complex. It's not as simple as I said, writing for amoxicillin 500 milligrams three times a day. It's a straightforward prescription. But here, the doses are variable, uncertain, and the component, the chemical component of the medical marijuana itself is a very variable thing. And of course, it's all very new to all of us. So three, Mr. Speaker, who then makes those decisions as to which particular product with high THC, low THC, how is that prescribed to the, uh, to the person who requires the same? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Ritter. To you, Mr. Speaker, again, ultimately, that decision will be made by the pharmacist and, the pres in this case, the two physicians who have signed the letter. And, and remember for a second that you have everything labeled. So all the ingredients is on there what the THC level is. There's 85, in, uh, 85 different chemicals in the plant. THC is just one. And that's all listed there. And so you can go off potentially the, not a lot of research, but whatever you found of what chemicals may work. You can try different things, but you know what ingredients are there. And the interesting thing about the THC levels is, is the, not a lot of research done, but most of it does show that the effective, the effective nature of this in children is very low THC levels. That's not what is causing the cure maybe to epilepsy or things like that. It's other properties in there. But again, there's no question that there it may be a, a mix and match, different attempts. But again, we're talking about people with very severe conditions that are looking for something to help make their lives more comfortable and better. And I think pharmacists and doctors would work with them to try to find the right balance. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Srinivasan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the good chair for that answer, which obviously clarifies a lot of these concerns that are, we, we have with regards to dosages and in terms of the formulations which can be used in this individual, which is very different than the other kinds that we use in conventional medicine. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can this be prescribed or, or administered in nursing homes, in hospices, in those kind of inpatient settings? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Ritter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It, it can now, but it's cumbersome. And so one of the changes to the bill, and I, excuse me, if you give me a second, I will point to the line. I don't know that's always helpful for individuals to find the exact line. But what we're saying now is that you can deliver it to the hospice facilities and it can be administered. And that is important. I mean, again, hospice means as definition, you have less than six months to live. And I think, yeah, I think it's line 300 or something like that, but I do want people to see it because it's an important change. Right around line 307. Yes, and so now you can give it to these facilities and they can handle and distribute it for them. You can imagine the way it works now is your primary caregiver may have to drive and bring it to you or something like that. They may have to work. They may be out of town. And again, we're talking about people in hospice care with less than six months to live in most cases through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Srinivasan. Through you, Mr. Speaker, since others can now administer that under the supervision of the physician, and uh, unfortunately, lapses can occur. And when they do occur intentionally or unintentionally, where is the liability? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Ritter. Through you, Mr. Speaker. In terms of liability, there's already protection for physicians who prescribe, in this case, or write the the letter of certification. We add that protection in for nurses as well. Um, and I know there might be questions on liability. We had them in the committee process. But again, Representative Shapin mentioned it very well. There is great concern for people. We are in an interesting area of federal and state law in terms of how they interact with one another. Although I would say we're now one of 24 states of medical marijuana. If we pass, this would be now 15 states would have medical marijuana for children. Um, 
but ultimately there is no liability for the for administering the drug either to an adult or, or for prescribing it in this case to an adult or a minor through you. Representative Srinivasan. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I know this liability, as the good chair has talked about, this immunity that he's talked about, is a big concern to a lot of us. And I know some of my other members will probably be raising those issues to discuss that with our good chair. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I want to focus on the board that we have, that we have which is the eight-member board that we have that is comprising of the, of the physicians, that then their role, as I understand it, is they are an advisory board. What they do is come up with suggestions, come up with recommendations, and then they advise the commissioner. Through you, Mr. Speaker, is it an advisory board? Representative Ritter. Through you, Mr. Speaker, yes, they make recommendations through you. Representative Srinivasan. Through you, Mr. Speaker, at this point in time, it is my understanding that the, of the eight positions that are available that should be filled, we only have five, five positions that have been filled. So we have, though this legislation on the adult side has been around for a few years now, we still do not have a board that is fully functional in as much as in terms of numbers, that only five of them are there. So it is, in this legislation, are we changing the criteria to become uh, a member of this board? Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Ritter. Through you, Mr. Speaker, line 330, we are. There are only five, that is true. Eight is the number. We're also changing the quorum from three to four. And what we're saying is that if you look at the current one, it's very specialized. We do this a lot for task forces, as some might recall, or other boards or commissions. That's why we have a lot of state boards and commissions that are not filled. This doesn't water it down, but I think it takes a broader view that there should be a background in the use of marijuana for palliative and medicinal use, but it does broaden a little bit to find more doctors through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Srinivasan. Through you, Mr. Speaker, this board now that we are talking about has to now include a pediatrician. Is that right through you, Mr. Speaker? Representative Ritter. That is correct through you. Representative Srinivasan. Through you, Mr. Speaker, is this pediatrician that is on the board, serving on the board, can he be a general pediat pediatrician? I was a pediatrician before I became an allergist. So in my pediatric training, there was not any much training about marijuana. In those, but that was a long time ago. You know? I will not tell you how many years. I don't want to age myself. But so is this going to be a pediatrician, a general pediatrician that is going to serve on the board? Or is it a pediatrician who has qualified in terms of either a fellowship in terms, in terms of palliative care. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Ritter. Through you. They should have some knowledge about the palliative use of marijuana. So that applies to all eight of them. And also, the Connecticut chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics sort of weighs in on the appointment as well. And you would hope through their association they might identify somebody who was more well, more well versed in this subject than others. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Srinivasan. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Moving on from the board to the, to the research part, which is critical, which is which I think one of the, along with the fact that we will be, we will be capable of, of giving these children medical marijuana for their medical conditions, which is what could happen pretty soon when this becomes law. But equally important is looking forward that we could be the trailblazers, the trendsetters, as far as research is concerned in this nation. Through you, Mr. Speaker, could we, do we have an idea as to where the research will be conducted, or is it something a work in progress, and we will see as the interest arises in terms of doing research on medical marijuana? Representative Ritter. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I do not know who currently is interested or who currently may be doing this research program, but I would add that um, we have some great research institutions in this state, and I'm sure they might be good options for someone through you. Representative Srinivasan. So through you, Mr. Speaker, as to who is going to do research, which lab is going to do research, and what are the criteria for research, that will be under the purview of the department through you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Ritter. 
That is correct. And so you'll get a valid registration through consumer protection. They will promulgate regulations associated with that. And that's how we'll come up with our research component through you. Representative Srinivasan. Three, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the good chair for his answers. And as we said earlier when we began this conversation, this is not an easy decision we are making today. It's a decision that is going to impact on the lives, as the good chair said, probably an estimate of about 100 children in our state. But for those 100 children, for those 100 families, for those taking care of those children day in and day out, we heard and saw the gut-wrenching testimonies in public hearing, not just this year, but last year as this bill was discussed there as well. So there are a lot of uncertainties in, this, in the treatment with medical marijuana, no question about that at all let alone the constitutional factor which is already addressed too. We do not have a lot of research on the subject matter. And usually we are a nation that likes to do research first and then after that treat according to the results of the research. But here we are in a way going backwards. But that's what the situation demands and we have to do what is necessary for our children. And when we see this demand over and over again, when we hear the cries of agony of the children, and more importantly, perhaps the families that are taking care of the children, we have to say, yes, we do not know to this day what the long-term implications will be on the developing brain. Do I, do, we ha do I have an answer? Does the good chair have an answer? Does any of us have an answer? The answer is no. Just two days ago on NPR, there was a big discussion by experts on the impact of medical marijuana on the developing brain. And I know it is a concern to a lot of us, including me, that the research is not there. That would be ideal. In an ideal world, we would have done all this research, but because of the federal involvement and they're, they're not being keen on doing this research, we have some, we have some reports but not true research that we would all like to see. So we are caught between the scientific side of me saying we need research, we need good research, we need to make sure it works, and it most importantly, equally important, that it does no harm. That's the importance of getting research. Is it effective? Yes. At what cost, at what price, does not have any significant side effects. We do not have that, unfortunately yet. But in this piece of legislation, we are working towards that, what we do not have in creating that opportunity that we can have research in our country, in our state. And treating these children, 100, whatever the number may be, even though we do not have adequate research, we know from anecdotally that, anecdot an anecdotally that it works. And, and because of that, for that reason that we have seen over and over again stories that it has worked in these individuals, I am in strong support of this piece of legislation. And I want to thank the good chair for his answers this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.